Picasso was naturally drawn to the effervescent Paris of the Roaring Twenties. Now he pushed to its extreme the deformation of the body begun in those giants, as if he wanted to be part of the young poet André Breton's surrealist movement. The dance, painted in 1925, was in its skewed composition a revolutionary piece. One that would completely overturn Picasso's whole body of work. It's a dance macabre that brought all the phantoms of the past back to life. The dancer, driven mad by the furious rhythms, was germane. Like the Grim Reaper, she spread death among the men, like his friend Casajemus, who had tried to love her. For Picasso, love was always fatal. Sexuality was always violence. Even a kiss became a thing of terror in this painting from the same period. The kiss, or the journey of the painter, anguished, obsessed and tormented to the very depths of his being. One day in January 1927, Pablo, whose marriage to Olga was by now on the rocks, was walking round the opera district. Suddenly, out of the blue, he noticed a young girl. He had found the perfect model he'd always been looking for. When my father first set eyes on my mother, she was a splendid 17-year-old, blonde, blue eyes, fresh skinned. And she was going into the Galerie Lafayette department store, the famous one. And he noticed her from outside because there was this sort of bin where she spent ages looking for collars and cuffs. So my father was waiting for her, waiting and waiting, and she never came out. She didn't know that there was this gentleman outside ogling her. He was the one who always went on about it. I was exploding, he said. Her name was Marie-Thérèse Walter, and she was only 17. She would soon captivate the man and completely turn around the artist. He m'a fait un beau sourire, m'a regardé, puis m'a abordé, puis m'a dit euh, « Mademoiselle, euh, vous avez un visage intéressant, je voudrais faire votre portrait, et puis je sens que nous ferons de grandes choses ensemble. » Obviously, he couldn't let anyone find out that he had an underage girl posing for him in his studio. So young Marie-Thérèse, with whom Pablo was by now enjoying a torrid affair, only appeared in his paintings in a disguised, coded form. Here are her initials, MT, as the frets of these guitars. And here she is disguised as the woman playing ball, stretched out across his paintings from the beach at Dinard, where Pablo, Olga and little Paul enjoyed family holidays, with Marie-Thérèse hidden away in a nearby guesthouse. Pétadina, où je voyais toutes ces choses bleues, euh, ça me faisait un petit peu peur. Je ne me permettais pas de lui demander si c'était moi ou si c'était Olga, parce que j'étais timide. C'était pas que j'étais timide, j'étais réservée sans plus. Je ne lui ai jamais fait la moindre des questions de rien du tout, vous savez, mais rien. These paintings are an amazing testimony to the dilemma of a man torn between Olga and Marie Thérèse. The kiss now represents the bitter face-off between the dark-haired Olga and the blonde Marie-Thérèse. Marie-Thérèse, the object of obsession of a 47-year-old man who couldn't tear himself away from the face, the smile of his mistress. He took photos of her, dozens of them. And, just for fun, he turned them into a sort of flipbook. So now he had at his fingertips a moving image of the woman he loved. When Marie-Thérèse at last came of age, it was a liberating moment for Pablo. Now he could fill his canvases with her body, her curves, her nakedness. These are masterpieces that will figure among his most famous works. C'était un ange lorsqu'il travaillait. Il était toujours debout, il était toujours sur la pointe des pieds. Il travaillait comme ça, il se reculait pour voir sa peinture. Et si elle lui plaisait, alors il dansait devant sa peinture et il était gracieux. Et en général, toujours content. Il a passé sa vie à me dire, ne ris pas et ferme les yeux. 
To keep his work secret from Olga and create the sculptures inspired by his new muse, Pablo bought himself a chateau near Gesor in Boisjolou. At first, the purity of Marie-Thérèse's face became classical sculpture. But then it was remodeled, deformed, refined. In a seemingly unstoppable frenzy, Picasso started turning out engravings, enthralled to the almost obsessive repetition the medium allows. Sexuality soon tipped over into bestiality as, inspired by Marie Therese, he seized on a new theme. The Minotaur. The half-man, half-bull monster of mythology to whom the Athenians yielded up their young virgins. Pablo the Minotaur, raping the young beauty. All the drama of his most famous engraving, Minotauromachy, centers on Marie-Thérèse. She is the female bullfighter, carried off by the disemboweled horse. She is also the carefree young woman who watches Pablo from her window as he loses all control. But above all, she was the only one capable of taming the monster and saving him from himself. Despite the ever-increasing tension between them, Olga and Picasso still kept trying to hold on to their family life. In these precious and rare family images, it was Pablo himself who set up a camera in the garden in Boisjolou to film Olga and Paul. It was a moment of happiness for a family that would soon split apart. Olga was losing the man she loved. When he learned that Marie-Thérèse was now with child, Pablo hastened the divorce proceedings. Bah, il a pleuré de bonheur et de joie. Il m'a dit que c'était le plus grand jour, jour, le plus grand bonheur de sa vie. Et puis j'étais contente, il était gentil de m'avoir dit tout ça. Alors tout le temps il disait, je divorce, 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 divorce. Olga simply couldn't imagine not being Madame Picasso. Nevertheless, Pablo got the separation he wanted. Olga got the chateau in Boisjolou to live in. And because divorce was still illegal for a Spaniard, she was able to remain Madame Olga Picasso till the day she died. So Pablo would never be able to properly acknowledge his future children. The first to arrive was little Maria de la Concepcion, born the 5th of September, 1935. I arrived. What's more, I was half dead, because they'd so anesthetized my mother that I came out a bit floppy. But what to call this thing? Is it a girl? So naturally, the only thing they could think of, and both of them came up with it, was Maria de la Concepcion, the little sister my father lost when he was 11 or 12, and still grieved for. Now 54, Pablo installed Marie-Thérèse and Maya in a house at tremblay sur morde lent to him by the gallery owner Ambroise Bollard. Pablo now had Marie-Thérèse in a golden cage. Like the loving and dutiful companion that she was, she accepted her fate, giving herself forever to the man who had awoken her from innocence to experience. He wrote passionate letters to her. I love you tonight, more than yesterday, less than tomorrow. I love you, Marie-Thérèse. I love you, I love you, I love you. But the Minotaur was insatiable and he was already devouring yet another woman. His new victim was Dora Ma. She was 30. Dora was a photographer 
half French, half Yugoslavian, brought up in Argentina. She spoke Spanish, and she thought like a surrealist. She impressed Pablo with her passion for politics and her knowledge of and love for art. She was introduced to him by the poet Paul Eluard. Apollinaire was no more. Max Jacob had withdrawn to a monastery. Eluard was now the poet for Picasso. Pablo's social and artistic circle revolved around surrealism. Along with Eluard, the young photographer Man Ray and Dora, he was gripped by a craze for politics. He found it intolerable that democracy was in such peril. With Italy falling to Mussolini and the German Republic under the heel of Hitler, transcendence must now come from poetry. And in those troubled times, Picasso would try his hand at it himself. When his surrealist friend André Breton published Picasso's poems, he would note that he has the impression of being in the presence of an intimate journal. Let the rats feast where they will, but let them not eat the pigeons in their nest, nor let them set flags and little lanterns in the wounds, and then in the morning all is tears. Give, snatch away wrongs, and kill I cross over, set fire to, and burn, caress, and lick, embrace, and look I sound on every flight, the bells until they bleed. <laughs> Pablo celebrated with Paul Eluard the Popular Front's victory in Spain, and then that of Leon Blum and his French Popular Front in May 1936. but General Franco wouldn't accept the left's victory, and he started a civil war. Picasso voiced his confusion in illustrated verse. Sueño y mentira de Franco, the dream and lie of Franco. The Spanish Republic, in complete disarray, asked its most illustrious painter to come up with a huge canvas that would adorn the Spanish pavilion at the next Universal Exhibition. Under the eaves of a large mansion in the Rue de Grande Augustin, Dora Mar had found just the studio Picasso was looking for. On the 28th of April, 1937, Italian and German planes that supported Franco and his nationalists bombarded and destroyed the Basque town of Guernica. When, on the 30th of April, Pablo saw the photos of Europe's first ever aerial massacre, he knew exactly what he had to paint. The canvas must be enormous. It would in fact be almost 25 feet long and over 9 feet high. The head of a woman with her dead child in her arms is howling at the sky, tears where her eyes should be. In the background, a horse struck down by death from the sky struggles to its feet in agony to scream out injustice. And Picasso explained it all in an explicit text. The Spanish Civil War is the battle of reactionary forces against the people, against liberty. In the panel that I shall call Guernica, I clearly express my horror at the military caste that has plunged Spain into an ocean of pain and death. Unveiled in July at the Paris Exposition, Guernica was taken on a fundraising tour for the Republican cause to Stockholm, Manchester and London before crossing the Atlantic. Picasso would not live to see the change in government for which the Spanish people had been waiting. It was not until 1981 that Guernica was finally hung in Madrid's Prado Museum. As the Second World War engulfed Europe and Paris was occupied, Picasso chose to stay. Dora would be his muse in those dark years, as the couple closeted themselves in the attic studio. It is her body, stretched, tortured, suffering. 
Lobard is Picasso's best-known wartime work, the image of a woman serenaded in her imprisonment, reflecting the agony of occupation.